What's up legends and welcome back to my unmatched strategy guide series. Grab your hunting hat and put on your finest pair of khaki shorts because today we're going to be taking a look at the greatest predator, two predators of all time, Mr. Robert Muldoon. Key thing to note before we get started, I myself am not very good at this character. I don't really enjoy using him because of his play style and as a result I'm not the best at actually playing him. Something I pride myself on is my proficiency with a majority of the unmatched roster, but I will admit this is one of the few characters I do not have mastered. So this video will be a learning experience for us both. Let's go. Starting off with the stats, Muldoon is a ranged fighter with 14 health and he has three ranged in-gen worker sidekicks with one health each, of course. They all have a move value of three. This is one of those times where you scratch your head and wonder why the heck a ranged character with two of the best mobility block cards in the game needs a move value of three, but I suspect it is for the same reason no contest expecteth exists, and that is the balance of the individual box that the character comes in. But damn, Muldoon is super, super mobile, especially with an ability that cripples the mobility of your opponent. 14 health is all right from the you playing as this character perspective but from the actual balance of the game perspective thank goodness it's only 14. this hero health total is just below average that being about 15 and change but on the bright side you can use your sidekicks as meat shields and you do have some killer four value blocks on the not so bright side however you have no healing, and very few copies of those killer blocks, so relying on your sidekicks to take hits and playing keep away with your hero is absolutely crucial for your survival. The health pool or total amount of health spread across all of your fighters is 17, which seems bad, but not as bad as it appears. You have the most sidekick revives in the game with 6, which means you actually have a health pool of 23, assuming you play all of your revive cards, which is actually like top seven in terms of health pools. And remember, your sidekicks can die by taking more than one damage, which much like Wukong's clones is a very favorable trade for you. Muldoon being ranged is thematic because why would a shotgun toting big game hunter try to defeat Bigfoot with his bare hands? <laughs> Move three and range is an insane combo though, and all I'm gonna say to back that up is that the only other move three ranged hero currently in the game is Medusa. Having ranged sidekicks is also great because your whole team has insane mobility on top of this combat range, meaning that there is effectively nowhere your opponent can hide from your reign of Hellfire. The only other double ranged heroes are Willow and Yanenga, once again proving that Muldoon is a statistical unicorn. Muldoon's ability is slightly complicated, and since the character card is not helpful by itself, uh, just to make sure everyone is on the same page, I will explain the extra trap rules first, and then go over the strategy aspect. I would like to mention there is a specific trap rule card included for a quick reference during a game, but I will be quoting the trap rule section of the Jurassic Park sets rulebook. Muldoon can use his traps to weaken and slow enemy fighters. He starts with a total of 8 trap tokens, and that is all he has for the entire game. When a trap is removed from the board for any reason, it goes back to the box. So interesting thing to note here. There was extra room on the punch board, like where all the cardboard health dials were and stuff like that. So there are 10 trap tokens included, although only 8 can be used each game, so you just have 2 extra in case you lose some. Whenever one is removed from the board, it returns to the fiery pit from whence it came, so they are all one-time use items. The rules continue. At the start of your turn, you may place a trap token in any unoccupied space in Muldoon's zone. As with other effects, if he is in more than one zone, you may pick a space in any of them. The target space cannot contain any fighters or other tokens, including other traps. So you place traps at the start of your turn, so don't forget about it. <laughs> if you want to do it, you can only do it then, so uh, you got to make that character card larger in TTS so you don't forget. The space you place it in has to be in Muldoon's zone and also unoccupied, which are two important things to remember, and only one trap can go in each space. The rules continue. When an opposing fighter 
enters a space with a trap, the trap goes off. This includes when a fighter is placed in or moved into a space by another player. The fighter must immediately stop moving and takes one damage. After the trap goes off, remove it from the board. So this is what traps do. They stop enemy movement and deal them damage. Very fitting. <laughs> After the trap is used once, it vanishes, never to be seen again. The rules continue. Muldoon and his allies may land on or move through traps freely without setting them off. This includes friendly fighters in team play. So I think this wording implies that you could set off your own traps, but why would you? <laughs> Card draw, maybe, I guess, but I don't think that's something you should really factor into your game plan. I guess it's just a nice thing to know you can can do. Uh, I have never seen someone do that in a game, uh, FYI, if that gives you any indication of how actually useful it is. So now that we all have an understanding of how the traps work, let's talk about how best to utilize them now. One key thing about trap mechanics that your actual ability card adds is whenever one of your traps is returned to the box, draw a card. This means your traps actually do three things, deal damage, draw cards, and stop enemy movement. Dealing one damage and drawing a card is very similar to an ability we've already seen on the second best vampire in the game, Dracula. The damage helps you kill your opponent faster, and drawing cards is generally a good thing, as it gives you more options for what to play from your hand, in addition to giving you card advantage over your opponent. I could go on a nice tangent about card draw abilities and why they are good, but I did that in my Bigfoot video, or at least I think I did. So if you want more details, go check that out, and hopefully I am remembering that correctly. Anyways, your ability works differently than Dracula's, obviously, because you don't get the output right away. You place the trap at the start of your turn, just like Dracula, but you don't get the damage or draw until an opposing fighter moves onto the trap. So I think this is generally a negative as now your opponent has more agency on when you actually reap the benefits from your ability, but you do have ways to pop the traps yourself with cards. Uh, more on that when we actually cover the cards. But remember, besides the damage and the cards, your traps stop enemy movement, which is why this delayed positive feedback is actually really, really good. Stopping movement is super powerful because it allows you to screw with your opponent's positioning plans. Muldoon has perhaps the best zoning in the game, which I will define as intentionally keeping your opponent at a specific distance, usually forcing them into a bad position or making them play in a certain way, which Muldoon certainly does. The traps really change the way your opponent approaches you with movement and maneuvers and things like that, and Muldoon can normally capitalize very well on your opponent being forced into suboptimal movement patterns. Let's go through some examples. So traps are super strong against melee fighters because you can put a trap somewhere that won't be adjacent to you at the end of your turn, and then put it between the enemy and Muldoon, and if they want to attack you, they have to move over the trap if that's the shortest distance, uh, which stops their movement and they usually won't be able to reach you that turn. Uh, let's say they're double maneuvering. And next turn, you can place a trap somewhere else nearby, attack them from range, and then move behind the trap and the cycle of violence continues. So they can't double maneuver forever. And if they never actually get close enough to land some attacks on you, they'll end up overdrawing and it will be a frustrating affair for everyone not named Robert. Uh, of course, you draw when the trap goes off, so you actually have to use your cards too. You can't just entirely flee like the slippery little weasel you are, unless the difference in deck counts is pretty extreme, and then you can just run away from the rest of the game. Uh, however, there are some ways around this for your opponent. Action gaining movement cards like Into the Woods, Mist Form, and Rolling Fog can be used to subvert the traps, and some really mobile fighters like Sinbad can just go around them, <laughs> there's another way around, while Bruce Lee and Arthur can pull you out of your fortress of protection with Bring It On and Command the Storms. So you're not invulnerable when behind your traps and or workers against a melee opponent, but it does really restrict when and how they are able to actually land hits on you. Traps are less strong against ranged fighters who are able to attack you without being super close to you because they can be in your zone and hit you over your traps and sidekicks. You'll have to set up your defensive wall slightly differently against them and probably utilize your workers 
I would say a little bit more aggressively, like making them part of the outer trap wall when normally you want like a layer of traps, a layer of workers, and then you. <laughs> so traps are also good against one health sidekicks because they just straight up kill them. Traps deal one damage, although they might get more use as an actual deterrent compared to a mean means of killing them. Uh, since outside of remote detonation and rending shot, your opponent has all the autonomy over which of their fighters are on trap popping duty. Against solo heroes, traps shine because the enemy team is just one fighter, so there are no sidekicks to set off traps and tank the damage, so you can really restrict the mobility of the enemy hero as well as make sure all the damage from your traps really counts. And lastly, the utility and performance of this ability, and Muldoon in general, depends a lot on the map being played on. Wide open maps with lots of connections synergize a lot with cards like Remote Detonation and They Should All Be Destroyed, but can leave Muldoon exposed with lots of ways for enemy heroes to squeeze by traps and workers to get to him. And on the contrary, corridor maps with narrow paths and few connections make it hard to get full value out of some card effects while being excellent for zoning opponents with brutal trap placements. And of course, ranged favored maps are just good in general for Muldoon, since both he and his sidekicks can make use of a plethora of multi-zone spaces. The good news is most maps are usually not entirely open or corridor-esque. They are usually a blend of both, and good Muldoons will leverage their ability to fully capitalize on whatever cartographical features are nearby. You place traps at the start of your turn, and they have to be in an unoccupied space in Muldoon's zone, meaning that your opponent can move into your zone to block a space where a trap could go, and your workers surrounding you can also block spots. This means you have to think ahead and end your turn in a position that sets you up to be able to place a trap in a good spot if desired. And that being said, you should not be placing traps every turn. Think about it like this. Eight total traps means if you play them all, you've essentially banked up eight damage that will be dealt later, and eight cards that will be drawn in the future. That is a lot of cards, and with three regroups, you'll reach fatigue pretty quickly if a lot of these potential cards are drawn. The reason why you don't want to play all your traps right away is, well, for starters, once you play them all, you have no ability anymore, and it will be a lot easier for your opponent to play around the movement restriction. But secondly, if you are ever... If you ever end your turn with seven cards, on your opponent's turn, they can just run over several of your traps, especially if they have a sidekick and make you draw a bunch of cards, and you'll probably have to end up discarding at the end of your turn because the hand limit is seven. So you can always place traps down and then protect them by moving workers or Muldoon on top of them, but there are some characters that can still use card effects or abilities to move through your fighters, and if you have a fighter on top of a trap and a character moves through it, uh, they take a damage and you draw a card, but they don't stop moving because you do what you can and ignore the rest. So the following characters have such movement abilities that they can move through your fighters if they're on traps. Buffy, all of the time. Bigfoot, Achilles, Medusa, Faith, Yanenga, and the Raptors. You want to have at most two to three traps on the board simultaneously, I think, so that you still have potential traps left to use in a pinch, and you want to be in control of how many cards you draw if all of your traps on the board get popped at once. You only need to block off key choke points or lock down high traffic map areas to restrict where your opponent can and can't move to or through, and most of the time you really don't need all of your traps on the board to do so. There are a lot of specific nuances to this ability, I'm sure I've already spent way too much time talking about it, and a lot of that just comes down to the map and the matchups, so my best recommendation for further insight is to watch tournament games of great Muldoon players and study how they use their traps and try to emulate them. And of course, you can always just try things by yourself in practice games and see what works. Now onto the cards. The first one is Shooter! 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 A Muldoon only three value attack with a boost value of one and two copies. It says, during combat, if this is your first action this turn, 
this card's value is five instead. So this is an attack that goes from three to five after some sort of activation trigger, the most common being Momentous Shift, but there are quite a few others like Jabberwock's Claws That Catch, Spike's The Rush, and Invisible Man's Emerge From Mist. This type of attack is pretty solid, although slightly weak against Faint and other cancels because against Faint it only deals one damage, meaning the Faint is effectively blocking four. Although you could, in theory, throw this out second action as a blank three, but that would have to be a pretty specific scenario for you to intentionally use this card suboptimally. Maybe you want to throw out a low value attack so that Achilles wins the combat and draws. Who knows? The stipulation that this is only a 5 value attack if played with your first action means you are relying a little bit on your opponent's positioning to be able to trigger this as you have to use this without maneuvering beforehand. Obviously it has to be your first action. I think against the more aggressive melee fighters this won't matter too much as they'll probably end close to you a lot because that's how they hit you, but ranged characters, especially mobile ones like Robin Hood, will be able to avoid presenting you with easy opportunities to attack first action. Fortunately for you, Muldoon has a lot of after combat move effects on his black cards, which will let you set up your positioning on your opponent's turn so that when your turn starts, you are ready to shoot! <laughs> In addition to tricky necessary positioning, the first action aspect means it's easy for your opponent to predict. If you have the opportunity to attack with Muldoon first action, you're probably going to want to attack with this if you have it, but your opponent can see that coming from a mile away. Your greatest weapon on the unmatched battlefield is unpredictability, and making the combat mind games easy for your opponent to guess is not good. Therefore, your first action is actually a great time to throw out a regroup, or really any other attack, to keep your opponent guessing. I would not recommend using second shot first action though, because at only a printed value 2, it won't do anything against a feint, compared to cards like rending shot or they should all be destroyed, which will deal damage over a feint, or still have a decent effect if the value is blocked in the case of rending shot. However, this depends on how many first action looks your opponent is giving you. If you are going to end up with more than two to three first action attack looks with Muldoon specifically per game, I recommend not just insta playing this if you have it. If you aren't getting very many first action attack opportunities though, uh, playing this card if you have it in hand is for sure preferred. So overall, this is a very solid card that Muldoon relies on for damage and some spicy, spicy mind games. The next card is They Should All Be Destroyed. They should all be destroyed. Ha ha ha, Robert, Robert Muldoon, my game warden from Kenya. A Muldoon only four value attack with a boost value of three and three copies. It says, during combat, plus one to this attack for each trap token adjacent to the opposing fighter. While Shoot Her and Second Shot can become fives, this is the primary big attack for this deck. With a printed value of four, you have a nice damage baseline for the effect to grow from, and you'll still deal two damage over a feint. This attack gets plus one for each trap token adjacent to the enemy fighter. So this punishes your opponent for avoiding your traps because the more tokens they leave on the board, the larger this attack can potentially become. This card is a lot more situational than it might seem though, because depending on what map you're playing on, it might be hard to get this past 6, uh, which is still a great attack, don't get me wrong, it's just certainly possible on some maps to make this like 7 or 8. Another thing that potentially stifles this card is the speed at which you can place down traps, because using your ability to put one trap down per turn is usually not fast enough. It requires planning ahead multiple turns for a single attack and will usually be very easy to spot for your opponent. Oh, Robbie's dumping all his traps on that part of the map. Let me just not go there. <laughs> Fortunately, you can place multiple traps down at once with call for backup, which makes the setup for this effect a lot faster and more unpredictable. And you can use cards like Rending Shot to move your opponent into your minefield if it's already set up, and then blast them with this. So at worst, you place a trap adjacent to your opponent using your ability at the start of your turn, and then attack them with this card for only a 5, which isn't horrible at all, just with a lot of low value poke attacks in this deck, you'd ideally prefer 
that this attack do more damage than just a, a value five but that's still a great baseline for this card to have that's like the worst case scenario for it i highly recommend occasionally using this first action in conjunction with your ability like i just described because again it keeps your opponent guessing on whether or not it's shooter or this card and obviously feigning this card is a lot worse for them than fainting shooter they should all be destroyed adds to the terror your traps incur upon your opponent and is the most threatening attack in your arsenal. The next card is, I've hunted most things that can hunt you. They're lethal at eight months, and I do mean lethal. I've hunted most things that can hunt you, but the way these things move. A Muldoon only four value block with a boost value of one and two copies. It says, after combat, move each of your fighters up to five spaces. You may move them through spaces containing opposing fighters. This is like the eighth best block card in the entire game. It's insane. It's a four value block, which is the premium value for block cards because you will consistently block a majority of incoming damage. More on the value in a second, but for now, let's talk about the effect. Moving five spaces through opposing fighters is what I'll call the crash through the trees effect, since that's exactly what the Bigfoot scheme does. Five spaces is quite a distance for a single move effect, and moving through opposing fighters is great for getting out of pins, breaking combos, or closing in on a vulnerable enemy. However, this particular card effect lets you move each of your fighters, giving you effectively a potential maximum of four crash through the trees, which is just insane value. Now, normally if Muldoon is the one getting attacked, a few of your workers are probably already off the board, but even if you only move two fighters with this effect, that's still amazing. You get to reposition your entire squad basically wherever you'd like, and because this is a blue card, the effect happens on your opponent's turn, and you all should know by now that I love movement effects when it's not your turn. You get to set up your positioning for free because it's not costing you an action, and your opponent will have minimal time to react if it's their first action and no time to react if it's their second action. And you get ideal ability usage as well as the opportunity to set up attacks like shoot her for optimal usage. This card effect is phenomenal, if you couldn't tell already. Now, blocks are an interesting topic for Muldoon because as you can imagine, that hat ain't doing much to prevent concussions the source of which being a large log, obviously. For this reason, we are going to take an in-depth, deep dive into Muldoon's block package. There are 14 block cards in this deck, two hunteds, three leapaways, three feints, three regroups, and three tactical advances. Tactical advance is a worker card, so Muldoon can't use it. And if you block with regroup as Muldoon, you basically insta-lose, which leaves us with eight cards to work with. For reference, the Raptors have 10 cards, and Beowulf and Dracula have 12. Granted, you technically have 11 with Regroup, but if you're going to be blocking with Regroup out of any reason but necessity, um, please get into contact with me so we can schedule a game. I'd love to beat you. <laughs> so like I was saying, 8 cards to block with. That is a huge yikes. Astronomical yikes. 5 of those 8 are 4 value blocks with excellent move effects, and the other three are feints, which is normally a great card when you have a bit more defense to fall back on, but 14 health with no healing means that the low value of feint is actually a big downside, because while you are canceling an effect, only preventing two damage will probably cause you to take more damage than you'd like, so feint is less of an automatic play for Muldoon than it is for most people. Your goal as Muldoon is to not get hit. Your opponent's goal is to hit you at least five times because after your fifth four value block is gone, you're gonna go down fast. So yeah, use your traps, workers, and range defensively and you should be good for most of the game. <coughs> Coward, what? I didn't say anything. I love this character, remember? <laughs> <sighs> the next card is Call for Backup a Muldoon only scheme with a boost value of three and two copies. It says, choose two different effects. Place up to three traps. Place all of your defeated ingen workers, if any, in Muldoon's zone. Draw two cards. 
This card has a choice on it! I love choices! This scheme lists three options and you choose two unique ones and some of these are pretty game breaking. Placing three traps is huge. You normally can only place them one at a time at the start of your turn. So this provides you with the only other way for you to place traps in your deck, as well as the only way to place multiple traps down simultaneously. This also has massive synergy with they should all be destroyed as you can play this, place down a bunch of traps and then have an easy seven plus value attack second action in a move named after the first ever unmatched uh, champion of the world, Prospero. <laughs> Remember that you only have eight single use traps available to you each game. So if you attempt that combo twice per game, you are left with two multi-purpose traps, which is not a lot. And without traps on the board or in your reserve, you become a lot weaker. It's easier for enemies to get to you and a lot of your cards become a lot worse. The other thing about placing down a bunch of traps all in one place is that if you and or your opponent ever leave that location, those traps are doing nothing to help you defensively. So plopping down a bunch all at once might be a short-term spike in value that causes you problems in the long run, but provides you with an interesting decision of how to use your traps throughout the game. Of course, you could always just camp around that clump of traps after you've placed them down. That works too. So this is something that you can roughly plan out at the start of the game, but being able to adapt and creatively use traps on the fly is what separates great Muldoon players from the rest of us, probably. Of course, you can't forget that up to includes the defender resolves first. <laughs> Whoops, sorry. That's the wrong, common, easy to figure out on your own rule scoof. I meant to say up to includes zero, as well as one or two in this case, so you can always pick this option and just not do anything. You can place less than three traps to give your opponent a big heart mid-battle. That was a visual pun. People, rewind it if you missed it. And don't forget that when placing traps, you must follow the normal placement rules, meaning they must go in unoccupied spaces in Muldoon zone. The next option is placing all of your defeated engine workers into Muldoon zone. Yeah, this is a no-brainer. You're gonna choose this option like 90% of the time when you play this card because it's nuts. Normally, other sidekick revive cards do a little something while also reviving a singular sidekick. For a brief summary, the other cards include moving all your fighters three spaces through opposing fighters, healing two health, a three value attack, and two three value blocks. One of them draws you a card. So this card is a scheme, meaning it can't be fainted. It returns multiple sidekicks back at once, and also lets you trap like crazy or draw two cards. That's insane. You play this when you need your workers back, it's that simple. The draw and traps are a little bit more situational based on what you need at the time, but you always need workers. So don't feel too bad about not being able to bring all three back at once because a lot of the time, when you have a single worker left alive, your opponent can pretty easily ignore it and just go around it to hit you. So you might have to play this card early for less value than you would hope, which is still massive. And if you really want to maximize the numbers, just be really annoying with that last worker and trick your opponent into killing it, only to instantly revive it back and make your opponent cry. Also, don't forget that there needs to be enough empty spaces in Muldoon's zone for all the workers to actually come back to, so counting beforehand is very important. And the last option is Pot of Greed. Between the traps and regroup, I see this being the most underutilized option because rarely will you not have enough cards. But in a pinch, drawing two cards is nice. Be aware it will bring you a whole turn closer to exhaustion, more so if you place down three traps from the earlier effect, and drawing five cards, kind of, at once is a little scary. That being said, it's a good time to point out that you must resolve the effects in the order on the card and you have to declare which options you are choosing before doing any of them, meaning you can't draw your cards first and then decide to get workers back or place traps. 
This particular option, the card draw, does not say up to, so it's always two cards. It's never one or zero. That generally adds up to too many cards in the long run, unless you situationally need the cards. So if you are content with only getting your workers back, you can always select the trap option and place zero if you don't need traps or cards at the current moment. And lastly, this is probably the best card in your deck. Returning three meat shields is insane just by itself, and you also get something else with it if you'd like. So characters with forced discards like Sherlock or Giles will almost always snag this from you if possible. So you might have to play it sooner than desired in some matchups in order to avoid losing it altogether. So those are the Muldoon specific cards. So now it's time to talk about the workers. Whoops, there was a typo on the screen. Let me fix that real quick. Okay, that's better. Like I've said a thousand times already, the workers should body block for Muldoon and die so that he doesn't take damage. They are easy to get back in large clumps because as we just saw, backup is only a call away. They can attack with everything Muldoon can except for shoot her and they should all be destroyed, so they act as slightly weaker mini Muldoons and can threaten enemies with annoying attacks if not properly disposed of. Wow, these are real people I'm talking about here. Well, to quote the great John Hammond, spare no expense except the lives of your employees. What wise words from a truly genius individual filled with empathy and foresight. And before any of you guys asked, here's the tier list. The one and only worker card is Tactical Advance. Pushing, team moving there. A worker only three value versatile with a boost value of three and three copies. It says after combat, move each of your engine workers up to two spaces. This card is both very good and incredibly mediocre at the same time. Three value attacks aren't the best because you're not going to deal damage and it doesn't have a potentially damaging effect like rending shot or second shot and doesn't draw cards like regroup. So you're using it for the move effect, which I think is stronger on defense. There's also an opportunity cost attached to using this as an attack as opposed to either of the previously mentioned shots. So I think the only reason you'd use this as an attack is if you think your opponent won't block or you want them to waste a card, which I guess is fine. Uh, the effect can help you kite, but I like this card on defense better because moving each worker that's three maximum when it isn't your turn is incredibly powerful and it's much less likely to get fainted on defense it's like a weaker i've hunted most things that can hunt you and the same analysis applies there movement effects when it's not your turn are incredibly powerful the problem is the value though because you're usually not going to block the entirety of an attack with a three value block so the one health worker is usually going to die but this still lets you move the remaining workers regardless of if the one in the combat actually survived so i think this card has some promise but the value is pretty lackluster for the things you want to do with it rending shot is usually better as an attack you can just move the enemy further away instead of moving all your dudes around and not blocking is probably better on defense because besides the effect you're usually just chucking a card at someone who is basically already dead if you see an opportunity to make use of the effect great do so use the card but otherwise i would probably just hang on to this for a five damage second shot the next card is Rending Shot, a three value attack with a boost value of one and four copies. It says, after combat, move the opposing fighter up to three spaces. Deja Vu, three value attacks aren't super great because you really don't deal damage with them if they're blocked that often, but this attack is a four copy any with a great effect, so you really don't care about the combat damage per se, you more so care about spamming it and annoying your opponent. The effect lets you move your opponent, kind of like a reverse swift strike, 
And that's actually better than moving yourself here because Muldoon and his workers like to hunker down behind a wall of traps all together like a pack of wolves. So moving only one of those wolves isn't necessarily beneficial to you if you're leaving the safety of numbers behind. Moving the opposing fighter is a great effect for this deck because it aids in the zoning of your opponent. The effect helps you keep your opponent as far away from you and your fragile khaki shorts as possible. And let's hypothetically say you attacked an adjacent opponent with this card. All of your fighters are ranged, so normally you won't necessarily be adjacent to them, but this is the most extreme example of enemy proximity. If the effect goes through, you can move the opponent three spaces away from you. If your opponent is move two and melee, they'd have to boost their maneuver or use some sort of scheme effect to reach the fighter you just attacked with. And that's really annoying for them. Of course, move three fighters aren't bothered by this particular scenario, but most of the time you won't actually be adjacent to them. So it actually will affect them more substantially. This is great for moving ranged characters out of Muldoon's zone to avoid getting double attacked as a character with very limited defenses. This effect on an attack means it will trigger after defending after combat move effects, so you'll actually have final say in enemy positioning after they play a skirmish leap away, etc. if they choose to move their own fighter instead of yours. Rending Shot has synergy with your traps as you can move the opposing fighter onto a trap to deal them damage and draw a card for yourself, and it also lets you move opponents through map features such as secret passages and one-way arrows. Being only a 3 value attack isn't the best, but it does do 1 damage over a feint and usually worker attacks won't get fainted because your opponent would probably rather faint, they should all be destroyed or shoot her, so your best bet is to utilize this card through your sidekicks. Overall, a seemingly mediocre attack with a great effect and 4 copies of it to give you a lot of value throughout the game. The next card is Second Shot, a 2 value attack with a boost value of 3 and two copies. It says during combat you may boost this attack. I've talked about this card twice in previous videos except both versions have slight differences. Arthur's is called Noble Sacrifice and Medusa's is a printed value 3. All three of these cards work very differently in their respective decks so it might not even be a fair comparison to make. But this second shot lets you boost the attack during combat and you have a handful of three value boosts in this deck to get up to a five value attack, which is decent, I guess, but it's really only worth doing if you're going to deal at least two damage, in my opinion. The low printed value of this attack compared to Medusa's really hurts, but honestly, I don't think this deck needs that much more damage. The other problem is that all of your three value boost cards are good cards. You'd never use Call for Backup here unless it'll win you the game. You could use Second Shot, but there's only two copies of it, so it would be the only Second Shot attack you'd make the whole game. They Should All Be Destroyed is, I think, a reasonable choice if you can't make full situational use of that card's effect, uh, or if you're using this card from the perspective of a worker and couldn't, for some reason, just attack with a straight-up four from Muldoon. And you can for sure spare one copy of Destroyed for one of your two second shots, at least. And lastly, Tactical Advance, I think, is actually the best card to use, just because it's by far the most meh card of the four. There's a plethora of two-value boost cards in your deck that I won't get into that much because they're a lot more situational based on the actual amount of damage you're going to deal in the combat. Again, I think two or more damage is the target number unless you're just trying to close out the game with incremental single damage points and you don't care about spending the extra card. The other thing about second shot is that the effect happens during combat, after the defender has effects that modify their card value, meaning you will have full information and can choose whether or not you actually want to boost. Uh, if you can see that you're not going to deal that much damage, just choose not to and often that's probably the right choice. Two cards for one damage usually a bad trade for you. Uh, but again, you draw a bunch of cards, so if you just have excess crap in your hand that you want to get rid of, sure, one damage is one damage. Every damage point counts. There are only two copies of this, and honestly, that's fine. Uh, I think you'd rather have six copies of Rending Shot and no copies of this. So the current 4-2 split 
is better than the possible 3-3 split that could have happened. The next card is Remote Detonation, a scheme with a boost value of 2 and 3 copies. It says, choose a trap in the same zone as one of your engine workers. Deal 1 damage to each opposing fighter adjacent to that trap. Return that trap to the box. This is the only card in your deck that lets you set off a trap all by yourself, although I'd say the Rending Shot can also be used to do so as well. This card is for when your opponent doesn't want to set off a trap, so they foolishly decide to just chill right next to it. It's basically a bomb, I guess. <laughs> As Muldoon, you gotta grab your khaki gauntlet, smack this card down on the table, and say, Fine. I'll do it myself. This is potentially a source of AoE damage, the only one possible for this deck, so it has some application in that sense. However, your opponent probably won't park two of their fighters next to a trap if they can help it, assuming that they know this card exists. You might be able to make a sneaky play and place a trap between two or more of their fighters using your ability at the start of your turn, and then play this for a nice gotcha, but besides that, you probably won't see any AoE opportunities against a watchful player intentionally trying to avoid it. If you're using this to just hit one fighter for one damage total, I guess it's all right. Maybe if you really need the card draw, but this effect seems a little underwhelming. A scheme that deals one damage is pretty bad. A scheme that draws one card is pretty bad. It just replaces itself in your hand. So while you do get both simultaneously, it also costs you a trap from the board. So is that really worth it? Maybe, but if you're setting off traps yourself, your opponent isn't stepping on them, meaning you're not getting the actual like movement stopping ability from it. And I think it's just a lot better to punish them with they should all be destroyed instead of using remote detonation and then making future copies of they should all be destroyed harder to pull off in the future. I think this is perhaps the worst card in Muldoon's deck, just because in a lot of games it does nothing. Although, when you get more than one damage out of it, I guess you're getting like double the value of a trap, which I suppose is not nothing. You could also use this card as a pass by having no workers on the board or no valid traps, but then it literally does nothing, which I guess is better than something if you want to avoid overdraw. But yeah, that's a great way to look at this card. Half the time, you'd rather actually do nothing than do what's written on the card. Eh. And now on to the basic cards. Faint, Regroup, Leap Away, three copies each. As previously mentioned during the block package segment, Faint and Leap Away should be used as blocks for Muldoon. And yeah, you probably shouldn't attack with Leap Away. I can hear Zero's comment already. Well, if it makes you feel better, John, we actually have the same amount of competitive Muldoon wins. So forgive me, I'm a little sensitive about it. I'm just, I'm just kidding, it's a bit. Uh, if you win the leap away combat, remember, you can move the opposing fighter and you can actually move them onto a trap. So that's pretty cool, don't forget about that. Regroup is actually an attack in this deck, but you can also use it as a worker block if you really need the card draw. And lastly, it is final thoughts time. So like I said before, while Muldoon is not my favorite fighter because of his playstyle. I think it's good a character like him exists for the people that do enjoy him. The trap tokens are very interesting as they completely change the way your opponent has to play against you compared to other heroes. Interacting with a board like this is such a neat concept and there's a lot of ways you can utilize traps and even I am still working on figuring all that out. Like Invisible Man, Muldoon is a more defense oriented hero, except Muldoon has more attacks, trap damage instead of scheme damage, and is much more fragile. However, Muldoon isn't just some niche counterpick like I am is. Right now, Robert is actually extremely meta. He was the most played fighter in the Summer of Legends tournament, and he has a ton of favorable matchups across the board. Not entirely sure what the consensus is, but from my point of view, he is the fourth best hero in the game right now, ahead of everyone but the big three. With that being said, he requires a lot of skill to play, and knowing matchups is very important. I speak from 
experience here when I say that you actually need to practice with him instead of just listening to what other people say about him and expecting to win. <laughs> uh, key point here, I don't actually want to practice with him because I like aggressive combo fighters and not fragile old men. <laughs> so that's all I have for you guys today. I enjoyed my holiday break but I'm ready to crank out the content now. <laughs> I have quite a few video ideas lined up. And I don't wanna spoil anything, but there is a massive announcement coming soon. It's something really cool and I'm so excited to share it with all of you. This video will probably be on the longer side again due to some intricacies with Muldoon's kit. So thank you for making it to the end. If you're still here, Drop your favorite vegetable emoji. <laughs> That's always a fun activity to <laughs> to do when I'm reading the comments, just seeing all the different emojis. We're, we're doing vegetables this, this time. We're, we're switching it up. And one more thing. At the time of making this video, I am at like 986 subscribers, which is awesome. I'm so glad there's so many of you. Uh, but the 1,000 sub milestone has been a goal of mine for a long time and I'm just so pumped that so many of you are enjoying my content so far and hopefully I can continue to make interesting, informative, and entertaining videos for the next thousand. So thank you so much for watching and as always, like, subscribe, and yay!